Hey folks, Ben Gilbert here from Engadget, and we've got John Carmack of Oculus Rift, the uh, CTO of the company. And uh, that's a relatively new role for you, right? You, uh, your, your history is kind of storied in the game industry. You, uh, you created, you helped create Doom and uh, a variety of other classic titles. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing what your your kind of day to day is like at Oculus, right? It's uh, it's a little bit different than what you were doing in the past, now. Yeah, so uh, after more than 20 years, I'm kind of away from the mainstream of uh, doing the, t the high end titles. So I'm mostly focused right now on actually a secret project I can't talk that much about inside Oculus. But Oculus is split up into a number of different areas. Most of the companies in Irvine, California, right. but I'm still set up in Dallas. We have a few other people in Dallas that we're working on VR content teams. But I'm working on core technology for uh, something that I can't actually talk about right now, but it will be rolling into a bunch of important things. So I am spending most of my time literally like locked up in a small room working on technology. It's where I'm at my best, uh, I'm in my element, and in many ways I feel more like me than I have in a number of years. I'm sure. working on hard technical problems that are going to add a lot of value and that I hope are going to change the world. Okay, uh, so one of the, I, I've spoken to the Oculus folks a lot and I, it's something that's really personally interesting to me as a, as a gamer. It's something that uh, I've heard you talk about how it's a, a bigger step forward than the kind of uh, iterative steps that you see on console to console or mm -hmm. from GPU to GPU or whatever else. Uh, I, I guess what excites you most about, uh, about VR and, and why there instead of, you know, next-gen development or any of the other opportunities there are. Yeah, so if we look at just the last five years, watching how touch has mattered for things, where you can look at it, you can see a two-year-old working on a touch device because touch is the most intuitive way that human beings interact with the world. Sure. But glancing at things is the most intuitive way that we gather information from the world. And being able to just look around, to look into different things, that's fundamentally how we operate as biological beings there. And the computer has always given us this very limited window into our virtual worlds. We render incredible, majestic worlds, but it's shown through this small fixed window that we're just kind of gazing in as observers rather than putting ourselves into it. Sure. And where we're going to be in very near term with virtual reality is being able to put yourself inside that in a way that you really never have before. And that's powerful. That is more powerful than the next factor of four difference that we get in GPU power. Sure. You could give us unlimited graphics power, letting us render modern movies real time on the desktop in the games, and they would still be very similar games. They would look great. You could do a few things that we don't do right now. They they would be better than what we're doing, but not really that different. Sure. When you're inside things, it really does change the, the equation. You are feeling something different. You're experiencing something different. And a point that I make a lot is that the first 3D games, our first person shooters, they were literally a 2D game that I had made before, put into a new perspective, and all of a sudden it felt radically different. Sure. And the virtual reality experience can be the same thing, where tropes that might be almost cliched and old hat in conventional gaming, seen from that new perspective can be fresh and new and can have an impact beyond what people really would have thought they would have. Sure, sure. So the, the, I have a, a dev kit, we have one on staff, um, and it's uh, very immersive, but the one thing that really seems like it's missing is the, the head tracking component. It, right, like if I'm sitting in a cockpit in Eve Valkyrie and I'm looking around, uh, I can look down at my legs. But if I move my head forward, there's no difference, right? Like I, I see the same dif distance, and it's kind of uh, there's an issue there with regards to how I perceive things, right? It's actually one of the most. So we, there's a little bit of a head neck model that goes on. So if you're moving your head in a particular way, it tracks the position. It est it predicts where the position would be. Sure. But then if you start swaying your body, it's one of the easiest ways to make yourself sick. There, it's like yeah. look at the floor and sway side to side. It feels like the whole world is penduluming underneath you sure. because it's not tracking that. So a lot of the effort at Oculus has been going towards working out better position trackings. And you've got things like the, the Razer Hydra, which is an RF scheme that works sure. kind of okay-ish. It's not good enough for a head mount display. It's good enough for wands. Uh, but all the real work's going on with optical tracking methods and whether you've got inside out or outside in, active LEDs, flashed illumination, back, there's a whole bunch of different sure. things going on. Valve's doing a lot of great work there. Uh, Oculus has work internally. Uh, we're talking with other companies about things. So that we consider that one of the most important things. There's the obvious issues like the display quality, display brightness, persistence, but those are going to be solved. There are freight trains of technical innovation that happen in the mobile industry and we're just hitching a ride along with that. It won't be too long before we see 4K displays in head-mounted di displays, and that it's still not retina level. You can go a couple more factors beyond that, but that part of it is, I believe, well in hand. 
Uh, the tracking side is something that there hasn't been as much of a push for, and we're frantically working on a lot of that because that is one of the other really large issues. But we expect that uh, you know the next developer kit will have higher resolution and position tracking and addressing some of these significant issues. Okay. Um, and the, uh, the the mobile stuff that you brought up, that's kind of the other thing I wanted to harp on, is something that I, every time I talk to Palmer, he brings up how much more interested he is in that as a, a platform for the Oculus and, and how, uh, I, I just kind of wonder how that would work, right? Like, I, my phone now is so much different than I'm sure it will be in five years or ten years or whatever else, so what, what does that really mean, right? Okay, the way I believe it's all going to play out is that you will eventually have a head-mounted display that probably runs Android as a standalone system that has a system on a chip that's basically like what you have in your mobile phones. So you're looking at something that's a tenth or less the power of your desktop PC. Sure. But for any given point along the GPU power spectrum, there are good games and experiences to be made there. Maybe that means you can only do Quake 3 or something inside there, but if you've got a you know micro port that lets you plug in a Thunderbolt or DisplayPort or something there, and then run that from your super high-end desktop PC as an option, I think that's going to be the best of all worlds, where you've got some standalone thing that you can watch videos or have VR chat room things or whatever modest experiences you want in a standalone, unencumbered form. And it does make a big difference, not having a wire dragging off your shoulder. Sure, yeah. It's it's significant. Just like, you know, an, I t an iPad that you had to run plugged into the wall is not an iPad. That just defeats the purpose of the experience. But when you want to go ahead and take some, if you want to run Battlefield 5 in 120 hertz stereoscopic stuff, you're going to need a beast of a system to be able to drive that. And being able to attach that umbilical cord to sort of the home system, I, I think that that may be the model kind of for the next five years. I mean, eventually we'll have enough power that we won't care about it uh, docking like that. But certainly for the near future, there's experiences we want to have that there's no way you'll be able to power self-contained in the headset. But conversely, there are a lot of things that you will be able to do in a standalone mode that will derive value from not having to be tethered like that. Sure, sure. So uh, the, the the kind of last thing I wanted to ask about is the the retail concept of Oculus. I, I know that there is, uh, you know, and the, 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 I think the company term is that there is one coming sooner than later, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I, I guess I wonder how that would apply to average consumers, right? Like getting somebody to put something onto their head is, I think, a pretty big barrier to entry, and I wonder how to overcome that. So uh, we can't talk about some of the aspects that are going into the plan. I mean, there's, and it's still open to debate. I mean, there are factions internally that are for direct sale only versus store presence versus partners with different things. Sure. And it's not set in stone yet. There's things going on sort of at this moment that will influence how that comes out. But the, the plan that is clear is there will be another developer kit release that has a bunch of this stuff in there before it goes into something that's really broad-based consumer. Okay. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to the future. Thanks very much, John. You're welcome.